Okay, honors students, we're going to be talking through concept two notes, which is cellular transport. Now, cellular transport is critical to understand because it is how your body maintains something called homeostasis, which is the need of an organism to maintain and regulate constant or stable internal conditions. This is how your body keeps its internal environment your cell's environment stable, which is so important. So your body does this in many ways. It regulates temperature, pH, concentration of materials and nutrients, and it tries to maintain these levels in really, really narrow margins. So think about your temperature. You know, the temperature of your body tends to be 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, if you're in the 99s, um, you know, we start to worry you may have a fever. If you hit 100, which is only, you know, 1.4 degrees off, we start getting really nervous about you. Um, so these are things that they have this really narrow margin, so it's really important that they're regulated. And your body does a lot of this without you even thinking about it. You know, if your body's too hot, you sweat, and it cools to, in order to cool your body temperature down. So your body does this in a lot of ways, but we're going to talk through the six types of cellular transport um, that help maintain this because... The cell membrane is so critical in controlling what goes in and out of your cell, which affects homeostasis and how your internal environment is being maintained and regulated. So let's refresh ourselves about the cell membrane, which we talked about in concept one. We also talked about it in unit one. This is very important. It is selectively permeable, meaning it's picky about what it lets go in and out of itself. So only certain things can move across it freely, and other things have to go through a gate, these little ch protein channels we see, and some things can't get through at all. Um, and we classify all of the transport as either passive or active transport. Now, before we talked about the difference between passive and active transport, we need to talk about why and how is a cell membrane so picky. And it's because of these guys, if you remember, those are phospholipids. <clears throat> Remember, the cell membrane is made of phospholipids. We can go back here, you can see the two rows of them, okay? It's made of phospholipids. Remember, it has a phosphate head, and it has two fat, fatty acid chains, which are, serve as the little tails. It's arranged in a bilayer, so it's two layers. We saw that in the previous slide. Remember, the heads are polar. Um, they are hydrophilic, so they like water. Um, so there's your polar hydrophilic head. The tails are nonpolar, so they're hydrophobic, meaning they don't like water. Those are your nonpolar hydrophobic tails. So this really matters. Like this idea is so critical. This is why some things can go in and some things can't easily or not. So let's talk more about that selective permeability, meaning some are in, not all, in terms of getting through. Here's what can pass through easily. Small Particles can pass through easily because they can just shimmy their way through. Nonpolar molecules can pass through easily. Hydrophobic molecules can pass through easily. Okay, neutral molecules because those aren't tend to be nonpolar. And water can actually. So even though water H two O is polar, it's so tiny that it can pass through really easily. Now, what can't pass through easily are polar molecules. Okay, they cannot get through because even though the head's like them, these tails, that is a thick barrier that's going to say no, no, no to any polar molecules. So in order for polar molecules to cross, they're going to have to go through these protein channels. And then large molecules also. They either use vesicles or they use protein channels also in order to get through because they're just too big to fit. So that's really important. So let's talk through the passive and active that I mentioned earlier. Passive transport requires no extra energy because cells are moving from a high concentration, meaning very packed together, to a low concentration, meaning they're spread out. So we say they're going down the concentration gradient. I always say, think of this like a slide. The top of the slide is high concentration. The bottom of the slide is low concentration. If you are going to go down the slide, that doesn't require any extra energy because you're just naturally doing what you want to do, which is go down the slide. Active transport, though, requires extra energy in the form of ATP to be spent to bring things in or out of the cell because it's moving from a low concentration to high, so we're going against the gradient. Think, if you move from the bottom of the slide to the top of the slide, 
You're going against the gradient. You're going against it. That's going to require energy for you to get to the top of the slide. <clears throat> now, words to remember or to make note of. Concentration, that's the number of molecules of a substance in a gift given volume. And then the concentration gradient is the difference in concentration of a substance in one location and another. So think, if I was going to say, like, this lemonade is highly concentrated, I would say that it would be have a lot of solute, have a lot of lemonade powder in it. It would be really, really strong or really, really sweet. If it had a low concentration, I would say there that's not a lot of lemonade powder in it, not a lot of solute dissolved, so it would be really weak. It would be really watery. Okay, so that's what we're meaning when we're talking about concentrations and concentration gradients because we're going to be referring to those a lot over the rest of these notes. All right, so three examples of each type of transport. Passive transport, we're going to talk through diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. Active transport, we're going to talk through molecular pumps, exocytosis, and endocytosis. So we'll start with diffusion. This is just the spreading out of molecules across a membrane until they're equally concentrated on both sides of the membrane. Molecules are going to move down a concentration gradient from a high concentration to a low. So they're going down the slide. This requires no extra energy, which is why we say it's passive. I want you to think of this as if your mom or your granny or your auntie or whoever, grandpa, is making bacon. The smell in the kitchen is super strong. It's very high concentration. In your room, there's probably no smell of bacon. It's a low concentration. Over time, the smell is going to naturally diffuse through the house until it smells equally of bacon in every room of the house. Okay, that's what we're thinking when we're talking about diffusion. It's just naturally, it's passively happening. Now, real example, like actually in your body, is oxygen and carbon dioxide. These two naturally diffuse in and out of your cells so that your cells are constantly oxygenated in the way that they need to in order for you to be breathing and to be your body to be running. Now, I love pictures, so let's look at a picture. This dotted line represents our selectively permeable cell membrane. You see we have a high concentration of particles on this side and a low concentration here. So if this is diffusion, we would expect them to move this direction, and over time, they would balance out on either side of the cell membrane. Facilitated diffusion is a slight bit different. Okay, a little bit different. We're looking at a transport protein that's going to act as a protein channel to help facilitate the diffusion of molecules that normally can't pass through the cell membrane. So large molecules and polar molecules are going to use this. Okay, so we're still going down the gradient, still going high to low. We just have to have a little extra support in doing that. We have to be facilitated in doing that. Doesn't require extra energy. It just uses a protein channel. So an example is glucose or sugar is a large molecule that goes through a transport protein or protein channel, and sodium and salt is a polar molecule that does this. So your picture, same picture, we just have this protein channel now. And it's gonna, things are going to move through it until over time it's balanced on either side. So same picture, we're just adding this protein channel to it. All right, osmosis gets a little bit trickier, so listen very carefully. Osmosis is specifically the diffusion of water across the cell membrane. So water molecules move down the concentration gradient from high concentration of water to an area of low concentration of water. All right, pay very close attention to this picture. At first glance, you think, oh, this is the same volume of water on either side, so it's equal concentration. But that's not true. Think about the lemonade. All right, this would be watery lemonade this side. Look, there's barely any lemonade powder dissolved. It'd be very watery. This is a high concentration of water. Concentration, not amount, concentration. This side has a lot more lemonade powder dissolved in the same amount of water. So this is high concentration of solute of lemonade powder, but low concentration of water. This isn't watery at all. And we expect water to move from high to low. So it's going to move from the watery lemonade to the not watery lemonade. So it's going to move this direction. So over time, we should see this. Even though this is more water, it's the same water concentration now that we've balanced it out. Okay. okay very, take a minute and look at that for a second until you really understand what we're talking about here. Think of the lemonade. Now, in terms of osmosis, there's three types of solutions that a cell could be in, in terms of the environment that it's in. Its environment could be a hypertonic solution, meaning the water concentration in the solution is below what's in the cell. So there's more water 
inside the cell than there is outside. So water is going to move out of the cell and the cell is going to shrivel up. Hypotonic is the water concentration is greater outside of the cell than in. So water is going to rush into the cell, causing the cell to swell and potentially burst, which is, means it lyses if it bursts. And then isotonic, you have identical water concentrations to what's found inside the cell. So the cell is going to stay the same and water is going to move in and out the same. Now, I think a picture will really help with this. I highly suggest you draw these in your margin. Hypertonic. Less water outside, more water inside, so the water is going to rush out of the cell, causing the cell to shrivel. Hypotonic, more water outside, less water inside, water is going to rush in, causing the cell to swell up. Isotonic, same concentration in and out, so water is going to move in and out evenly, and the cell is going to stay the same over time. All right, let's practice a few. Let's look at some examples. All right, so let's look at this cell. All right, this cell has 20% of it is salt, sodium chloride, 80% is water. The environment outside of the cell is 10% salt and 90% water. So if, in terms of osmosis, what do we expect to happen? Well, water is going to rush in because there's more water outside than there is inside. So we would say that the cell is in a hypotonic solution and that the water rushing in is going to cause the cell to swell. All right, let's look at this one. 95% water inside the cell, 85% outside. So we'd expect water to move out of the cell, meaning the water or the cell, excuse me, is in a hypertonic solution and it's going to cause the cell to shrivel up as water leaves it. All right, last we have the same concentration, so water's going to move in and out. This is an isotonic solution, so it's going to stay the same. Again, to remember these, I think isotonic identical, I and I. So it's going to stay the same. Um, for hypotonic, I think hypo like a hippo. Hippos are big, so it's going to cause a hypotonic will cause a cell to swell up because water rushes in. All right, that's the three types of passive transport. Let's quickly go through the three types of active transport. So these, remember, these are all ones for moving substances that aren't going to cross through the cell membrane easily. Um, they might go against the gradient, so they're being pushed uphill. It's going to require extra energy for them to go from that low concentration to high. These are concentration brackets. Um, remember, some things are just too big, so they're going to have to go through a protein channel. Other things are going to need a vesicle, so we're going to talk through these three types of active transport now. First is molecular pumps. This is when a cell uses energy to pump molecules across the membrane through a protein channel. So, we're going to concentrate molecules on the side of the cell in order to send signals, and we can remove um, waste quickly from a cell too. So calcium, potassium, chlorine, sodium, these are all ions, and just they're all charged. That means they're all polar. So these all travel in this way. So similar picture to starting off with facilitated diffusion. We've got the protein channel. We've got more over here, less over here. Here's the difference. We're going to move from low to high. So it's going to move this direction and it's going to require energy to move that direction because that's not natural. Over time, we expect this shift where it's way more concentrated on this side than this, and that's going to send whatever signal it is we're trying to signal to our cells and the other cells in our body. All right, endocytosis, endo, think in, cyto, cytoplasm. So this is when a cell is going to use energy to import materials into the cell, and they're going to use a vesicle to do that. Remember those vesicles? Our little carts. So we're bringing stuff in. Example, in your body, this is how white blood cells engulf bacteria in order to fight infections. There are two types of endocytosis that I want to touch on. Phagocytosis is one. Think of this as cell eating. This is when the cell is going to eat stuff. It's going to engulf solids into the vesicle, and then it's going to digest them. Pinocytosis, think pineapple juice, pinot and pineapple juice. This is kind of like cell drinking. The cell is going to engulf liquids into a vesicle and digest them. So just two types of things, either phago for digesting solids, pinot for digesting liquids. And last but not least is exocytosis. So we're using energy to export things out of the cell using a vesicle. So they're going this direction. This is how nerve cells release neurotransmitters to pass signals to your brain. All right, and last thing I want you to do is I want you to take a minute and fill in this chart. Okay, we're going to have the six types of transport. You're going to label if they're passive or active. 
give example of substances that are moved in this way, and then also come up with a way that they help maintain homeostasis, which is a big picture goal here. So I'm giving you some clues for each one, so you should be able to fill this in and figure it out using your notes, just to kind of summarize and make sure you're getting what we're talking about in this concept. And that is concept two, cellular transport for my honor students.